Good morning, afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Balado Kaba, and I'm currently a board member at the International Budget Partnership. From 2016 to 2018, I was the first and only female so far finance minister of the Republic of Guinea. During my tenure, I led actions to increase women's participation. For example, I accommodated women completing their PhDs or other graduate studies with more flexible working hours and promoted increased women's participation in professional trainings by focusing more on in-country trainings. I am also part of the inaugural cohort of AMUJ leaders from the AMUJ Initiative, a flagship program of the Ellen Johnson Sirleaf Presidential Center for Women and Development, which aims to enhance, embolden, and engage women in public leadership in Africa. It is my real pleasure to be the moderator of today's side event on advancing women's leadership in public finance. Women's full and equal participation in all decision-making is a matter of fairness and essential for achieving the sustainable development goals. Evidence shows that women's participation and leadership contribute to more inclusive solutions and better outcomes. For example, studies show that countries with higher numbers of women in the legislature provide more effective oversight functions. However, women continue to be significantly underrepresented in institutional decision-making, including in public finance management. The latest data shows only 11% of countries have finance portfolios held by women, and less than a third of all heads of national audit offices are women. Today's event builds on a series of three workshops last year, organized by UN Women, International Budget Partnership and the InterSci Development Initiative that brought together members of civil society, finance ministries, and supreme audit institutions as individual constituencies to explore structural and institutional barriers to and opportunities for women's entry and advancement within these institutions and organizations. And so today, we want to explore the pathways for collective action by ministries of finance, civil society organizations working on public budgets and supreme audit institutions and how they can be pivotal in advancing women's leadership with the long-term aim of making public finance institutions drivers of gender equitable outcomes. The first half of this session will be a moderated discussion with key questions for the panelists to answer. There will also be time for the audience to interact with the panelists. Please use the Q&A function to type your questions as you hear from the panelists, and we'll try and get to as many of them as possible. And now let me introduce you our distinguished speakers. First, we have Marta Acosta Tuniga, who is the general controller of Costa Rica. She has worked in auditing and internal control in the public sector as well as in accountability, transparency, and efficiency of government procurement, both in Costa Rica and abroad. Marta has also been recently recognized as a national leader by the news media in, in her country. Congratulations to you, Marta. Next, we have Bina Palikal, the General Secretary of the Dalit Arctic, Attica, and the Land India. Her main focus is on economic justice and specifically looking at gender equity. She has worked across national, regional, and global political forums to ensure that marginalized communities are empowered and included in the fight for economic justice. We also have Zineb Buba, head of unit, economic and financial reporting and gender budget reporting in the Department of Financial Studies and Forecasting of the Ministry of Economy, Finance and Administrative Reform, Kingdom of Morocco. Since 2011, she has been in charge of the National Gender Budget Report and provided guidance and support for the implementation of gender responsive budgeting in Morocco. Finally, we have Rihima Namutebi, the Director General of the National Budget at the Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning, Republic of Rwanda. 
So now let us get started on what I'm sure will be an interesting and lively discussion. Marta, let me begin with you. How, sorry, could you share specific challenges to women's leadership in auditing and how you and other women in your field have been able to advance within Supreme Audit institutions? Muchas gracias, Malado. Eh, saludos, es un placer compartir con todos ustedes. Para conversar sobre los desafíos en materia de liderazgo de género, es necesario tener en cuenta el contexto histórico, social, político y cultural de cada país como un factor fundamental. Costa Rica, por ejemplo, sufrió un cambio importante a partir de la década de los años 50 del siglo pasado, cuando la inversión del Estado a partir de la abolición del ejército se volcó hacia la educación y hacia la salud pública. Momento en que además eh, se, se crea una ley de igualdad eh, social de la mujer en 1990 y además nuestro código electoral estableció una política de paridad de género en 2009. Todo esto ha contribuido al desarrollo y fortalecimiento de este proceso. Sí hemos avanzado, sin embargo, el camino recorrido no ha sido fácil y el liderazgo femenino no se encuentra eh, exento de retos significativos. Por su parte, las entidades de fiscalización superior, tal y como lo promueve Intosai, tienen un rol de vigilar el correcto uso de los recursos públicos, deben fortalecer la rendición de cuentas, la integridad y la transparencia en los gobiernos y en las entidades públicas, generando así valor público. En este contexto, las entidades fiscalizadoras superiores están sometidas a los retos constantes del entorno y por tanto los liderazgos, sus liderazgos deben ser preparados, poseer visión nacional, global, así como poseer competencias duras y blandas para el ejercicio y conducción de estas importantes entidades. Por tanto, las oportunidades de educación y de aprendizaje para las mujeres líderes es clave. En cuanto al liderazgo de las EFS en el mundo, este sigue siendo, como usted lo dijo, predominantemente masculino. Aunque vemos cambios positivos en virtud de una mayor participación de mujeres actualmente. Por ejemplo, tenemos por primera vez una Secretaría General de Intosai en manos de una mujer. En Centroamérica y el Caribe tenemos alrededor de seis mujeres líderes y así en otras regiones. No obstante, a pesar de este aumento pequeño, las mujeres líderes siguen siendo menos de un tercio del total. Necesitamos entonces hacia el futuro esforzarnos por desarrollar y apoyar más a las jóvenes líderes. En este sentido, es importante un programa de la Iniciativa de Desarrollo de Intosai que busca el desarrollo de jóvenes líderes para generar cambios positivos en nuestras entidades fiscalizadoras. La mayoría de las personas graduadas de este programa son mujeres y lo han logrado por sus propios méritos. Es claro entonces que estos espacios brindan oportunidades para que mujeres capaces puedan distinguirse por sus méritos y crecer. Los liderazgos actuales de las entidades fiscalizadoras debemos direccionar la equidad de género internamente. El tono que pongamos a estos temas es muy importante. En nuestra entidad fiscalizadora, entre otras acciones, definimos en 2011 una política de género que busca equidad y balance entre la vida laboral y la vida personal. El 57% de nuestro personal son mujeres y el 35% de las posiciones gerenciales están ocupadas por mujeres que han llegado ahí por sus propios méritos, entendiendo que tenemos que seguir mejorando. Hacia lo externo, hemos auditado temas que promueven el cumplimiento de los objetivos de la Agenda 2030, incluido el objetivo de equidad de género. Para terminar, Pienso que cada sociedad debe aprovechar sus propias ventajas y oportunidades para promover los liderazgos femeninos. También la institucionalidad democrática y las partes interesadas deben promover logros de mayor calidad en materia de igualdad y de equidad para las mujeres, cuyo liderazgo es relevante. 
Muchas gracias. Thank you, Marta. Let me now turn to um, Zineb. Zineb, can you speak to barriers to women's leadership in ministries of finance and tell us how your department within the Ministry of Economy, Finance and Administrative Reform is addressing the issue, including by strengthening available data? Merci. Merci beaucoup, Madame Kaba. J'espère que vous m'entendez. C'est vraiment un, un honneur pour moi d'être parmi vous, d'être parmi ces femmes qui ont un parcours exemplaire. Et c'est sûr que ce parcours exemplaire est le fruit d'un effort colossal, et un effort de combativité qui a duré des années. Je sais, que, je sais très bien que ce n'est que le début, on va encore se battre parce que nous méritons, là où nous en sommes, et nous méritons encore le meilleur et nous méritons une part de, de décision. Donc, par rapport à, au ministère de l'Économie et des Finances au Maroc, c'est un ministère qui pilote la bêchisation sensible aux gens au Maroc. Donc, comme vous le savez, la bêchisation sensible aux gens au Maroc, il a débuté depuis 2002. Donc, malgré tous les efforts, pas que sur la question du bêchisation sensible aux gens, mais sur les avancées juridiques, réglementaires et institutionnelles, nous avons maintenant une constitution qui a, je dirais, constitutionnalisé l'égalité entre les hommes et les femmes en termes d'accès et de jouissance de droit. Et la question de la prise de décision et on, on constate qu'il y a encore des inégalités dans ce sens. Donc, et au ministère de l'économie et des finances, c'est vrai que c'est un ministère qui a fait aussi des efforts colossaux dans la matière, mais la présence des femmes, et surtout dans la sphère des décisionnelles, elle reste encore faible et au-dessous de, des attentes. La part des femmes dans les postes de responsabilité au ministère ne dépasse pas 24 Donc, euh, conscient de cette problématique, le ministère ministre de l'économie, de finances et de la réforme d'administration a appelé en 2019 à créer une commission interne qui se chargera des questions d'égalité entre les hommes et les femmes. Donc, effectivement, la, la commission elle a eu pris forme en 2019 et elle a eu l'une des, des réalisations phares de cette commission et l'élaboration d'une étude sur l'égalité ou bien l'inégalité entre les hommes et les femmes au ministère, et surtout sur la question de la conciliation vie professionnelle et vie privée. Donc, pour réaliser l'étude, une enquête elle a été effectuée, une enquête qui a duré en 2019 et au début aussi 2020, et les principaux constats, et d'ailleurs, il faut bien mentionner comme quoi, et l'enquête a couvert 32% de, des femmes du ministère, et l'un des principaux constats de, de, de l'étude, et bien de l'enquête, c'est que 45% des femmes fonctionnaires ont été non pas postulées ou refusent de postuler parce qu'ils ont peur de vivre un déséquilibre entre leur vie professionnelle et leur vie privée. Et ce renoncement et désistement, il est encore davantage plus accentué chez les femmes de, âgées de, au moyen de 34 ans. Il a été aussi constaté comme quoi les 22% des femmes enquêtées, ils indiquent que leur vie personnelle impacte ou a impacté le, je dirais, la, la, leur décision de postuler ou d'accéder à l'accès la, à, la, à, à la responsabilité. 28% comme quoi leur vie personnelle et les charges qu'ils ont à savoir, les charges d'enfants de, et aussi les charges de personnes dépendantes, soit des parents, etc., ils impactent négativement l'accès à la formation et aux études. Et 36%, 36%, et ça c'est aussi un pourcentage qui est très très important, que 36% des femmes qui ont déjà des postes de responsabilité, 36% de ces femmes, elles ont déjà réfléchi et songé à quitter leur poste de responsabilité à cause de ces poids de difficultés de concilier entre les impératifs de la responsabilité professionnelle et aussi la responsabilité personnelle. Et 23%, ils ont, ils ont comme quoi confirme comme quoi ils ont dû affaire à des discriminations liées au genre dans leur travail et 31% ils ont appelé à ce que les femmes à ce que l'égalité entre les hommes et les femmes soit renforcée en termes d'accès au poste de responsabilité et 15% de ces dames de ces femmes enquêtées ils ont demandé à ce qu'il y ait une présence des femmes dans les jurys pour les, 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 les appels à candidature si je... I don't know if I'm the only one, but I can't hear you. Oh, okay. Eloquence, oui, oui. Continuez. Et voilà. Et le constat le plus important, c'est que le, 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 la contrainte 
qui est toujours euh, mentionné, sinon euh, par la plupart des enquêtés, c'est que cette question de conciliation entre vie, euh, vie professionnelle et vie, et vie euh, personnelle. Donc, ce qui fait que cela appelle, je dirais, pour que les femmes soient encouragées à accéder à la, au, à la prise de décision et aussi à, à l'ensemble des prérequis qui sont importants pour accéder à la, à la, à la prise de décision, à savoir l'accès à la formation, l'accès aussi aux études au cours de, de leur travail. C'est la question ici de ce, comment faire et comment organiser le travail de, théma, de telle manière à ce qu'il soit, je dirais, plus flexible, c'est la question de la flexibilité des horaires qui a été demandée par la plupart des femmes enquêtées et aussi la question de l'infrastructure relais ou bien les infrastructures de proximité, à savoir tout ce qui est en relation avec des crèches et garderies. Et d'ailleurs, le ministère il a commencé déjà sur cette voie de mise en place de, de garderies et de crèches. Et je tiens juste à mentionner encore un point, juste un tout petit point par rapport à ce qui se fait en la matière, c'est que le, le département de la réforme de l'administration, qui, qui aussi qui relève de ministère, il a mis en place depuis 2010, je dis bien depuis 2010, un réseau de concertation interministérielle qui est une plateforme de coordination de l'ensemble, je dirais, de, 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 des départements ministériels pour mettre une place, une stratégie nationale d'égalité des sexes dans la fonction publique. Cette stratégie, elle a été élaborée, elle est actuellement en cours de, dé de déploiement et parmi ces réalisations phares, c'est une circulaire ministérielle pour la mise en place aussi de ces, de ces crèches et garderies. Et je, et je partagerai encore euh, par la suite toutes les leviers. Bien. Voilà, vous pourrez également compléter par la suite. Je voulais juste... Oui. Sorry, I, I would like to ask the panelists to please... Slowly for um, the, the interpreters. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for this account, Zineb. I think that was very interesting. And I think you also reinforced what Marta said earlier about the need to have, I think, a legal framework already in place, but that is not sufficient. We also need bold leadership, leadership that is ready to face also some, some resistance and reluctance when we talk about promoting gender parity. Um, I would like now uh, turn to uh, Bina. Um, and uh, tap into her experience in uh, civil society. Um, so Bina, my question to you will be the following. Um, can you please reflect on the importance of opening spaces for women in all their diversities, the major challenges women face, and how their participation can increase public resources for gender responsive services? Uh, thanks, uh, Ms. Malado Kaba. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here, part of uh, this panel with so many powerful women on the same panel. I think this is like a dream come true. Uh, but um, uh, it's, it's also difficult to go after two uh, powerful women who've spoken from the ear, from the perspective of the government, and I'm probably on the other side. So um, just to say that I think uh, public finance, I just like to Uh, start with a small uh, narration about my own experience in uh, public finance and how when I'm having discussions with um, a room full of men sitting at the table uh, and talking about public finance and having this one woman who's, who's from a marginalized community, from the Dalit community, I've oftentimes in the earlier years when I started it, it was so difficult to actually even uh, have a conversation with them going because they would look at me right through me, you know, and they talk to the men in the room, but, you know, almost ignore and almost invisibilize the fact that there is a woman sitting there at the table discussing budgets and public finance. So from that experience, you know, and having that and all, seeing that over the years, I think that it's not only important to have representation of women in these spaces, but also which women, you know, we, we cannot talk about only women who had the privilege because we're not a homogeneous group. Women are not a homogeneous group. So we need to also take into consideration, it's important to look at women who have been marginalized traditionally and who have to have a seat at the table. That is so critical to these opening up of these spaces. And experience in India, We have about 50% uh, reservation or affirmative action in the local governance level for women. But the women who are elected into those positions are also just nominal, nominal candidates. You know, then they have no power. 
you know, they are either their husbands or their brothers or they are, you know, uh, uh, the power is in their hands. So how do we ensure that we have women in these spaces, which is so important that as women, we're not just there sitting at the table, but we're also contributing to the larger agenda of um, furthering economic justice, you know, budgets and public finance. I think that is that is so important for me. The other thing I think is not just having women at the table, but in decision-making spaces. And how do we ensure that we have this um, uh, them in the decision-making? Who is the decision-maker today? Uh, during the COVID, you know, uh, all of you must have read the study which said that the women who were running the countries in the world were doing the best in terms of responses to COVID. So that itself shows that we have such good models where women, when in control and when in power, are leading countries to much more to have more successful and uh, have mechanisms that are you know well placed to address issues like a global pandemic. So I think that somewhere we are one is we need to break those stereotypes that have been made that women cannot take on these kind of areas like public finance, like budgets, you know, they're not meant to be there. So this opening up of the space has to be done, not just by the men or the people who are there, but also we as women to see that within us, you know, who are the women who are sitting there? Are we from the privileged backgrounds? Who can we bring in? Who are the different diverse um, faces and names that we can bring in? And I think it's so important to ensure that the women sitting at the table are not just uh, are from a diverse and inclusive background so that we can have more diverse uh, voices. Like they say, nothing about us without us. So that would be a, a mantra or something that we need to take forward when we're talking about women uh, in public finance. Thank you so much, Bina, for also highlighting the fact that we, when we have to deal with a man full of room, we, we somehow feel totally invisible. I, I felt that on many occasions. And I, what I also appreciate in your intervention is the fact that we need to take into account the diversity of women because there are plenty of us with very different backgrounds. And uh, I like that, that you know, the, 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 the fact that you also highlight that we need that there needs to be a connection uh, between us working in public sectors and also women um, from day to day life and, and how can we best promote their uh, everyone's rights. Now let me turn to Rehima. Um, Rehima, how can we how can women in leadership um, positions in public finance contribute to improve institutional practices and gender equality outcomes? Thank you so much, Ms. Malaba Malado Kaba. Sorry. Uh, good morning to you all, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Hope you are able to hear me. Yes, we can hear you, Rehima. Please go on. Thank you so much for this opportunity to join uh, this webinar and for such a great question you have asked regarding how women in leadership positions are in public finance contribute to improved institutional practices and gender equality outcomes. I would join all the panelists uh, regarding in line with their contributions and as well as uh, different uh, forums where research surveys has been carried out all is taking place emphasizing this because uh, I also appreciate and acknowledge that uh, it's very important to strengthen the pipeline of women in public finance jobs. And since we all know that gender equality in leadership is critical to strengthening a country's competitiveness as well as economic development. Hence, the reason why I would appreciate the own discussions because as we go with all these discussions at the end, we come up with um, recommendations, we come up with a uh, course orientation to guide the way forward. I'm looking into, when I look at public financing here, I'm looking on how do we engender, how do we engender public financing this way? After acknowledging uh, its importance, 
uh, its relevance. And in this way, what guided me well in this question of the women leadership uh, in public finance, it's because of what actually is happening in Rwanda. So I would say that such discussions are real in Rwanda. And then whatever that you could see happening in Rwanda and especially having a strong public finance system, I would say that it's because Rwanda was able to appreciate uh, gender equality in this, whereby already the national gender strategy gives it clearly the priorities as a nation and objectives. For example, one of the objectives uh, would in include strengthening the mechanisms for promoting women's meaningful participation in leadership and decision-making positions. Uh, that's it. Basically, when you look at the system of a nation or a government or an organization, it's basically made up of the public finance. It's uh, from where policy reviews uh, take place through implementation. And at the end, we go to the M1E, the auditing part of it. So what I would say in this way, I want to emphasize uh, the importance of the clear policies as we go about this and as we want to appreciate the importance of leadership and bringing in Rwanda because of clear policy guidelines in, guidelines in place. And basically to go down to talk about the importance, it's built on this background, which I'm currently giving out. And I'm, I'm able to report that already having that strategy, it goes straight away to public finance. The organic law of state finances and property is clear. It gives it clear whereby the entire public finance system has to consider gender equality and this way that's why I find the gender responsive budgeting. Rwanda currently implements gender responsive budgeting. And that's why you find it one of the countries of worldwide implementing this where many would want to learn from. The law is clear on how do you consider it in the public policy review, uh, reviews from the planning uh, system, selecting priorities to the auditing, the M1E part, whereby you're like trying to start from the policy reviews and then at the end you're able to track through auditing. And then again, you, we are able to report that because of such mainstreaming and such strategy we have, gender strategy, which is clear of women positions in, of course, pu public institutions as well as the private, uh, private sector, I'm able to report for now that you can find that in parliament for now, 61%, these are women. In the cabinet, 52%, these are women. When you look at government agencies, the chief budget managers, 30% are women. At the level of director generals of institutions, 34% are women. So I'm trying to bring this to relate it to my question because when my question, looking at the question, uh, women leadership positions, uh, of course, uh, how does it improve? It's, I wanted to bring that background for us to see the importance of uh, having women as leaders in public finance, uh, in, in, in public finance. And this is uh, from, from the system, the, the, the existing systems. So in this way, I would say that this would be, of course, like my personal view, but I would expect, of course, further research, further surveys to be carried out, to have clear information or clear results with, with a basis for us to be able really to show or to appreciate the, this, the role, the role of women leaders, for us to be able to improve the institutional practices and gender equality outcomes. Because when I look at gender equality outcomes, I'm looking at measurable changes. You know, what measurable changes do these women uh, uh, put in place or try to, to push forward uh, to ensure a reduction in gender inequality as well as improving gender equality between men, women, girls, and boys. So for me, I would see the importance as we are advocating. When women are in such positions, it's easy to advocate for gender responsive policies and the laws. Thank and you. I would 
example of Rwanda for now. So because of such big number that is in there, we have seen that everything is clear from the gender strategy to the organic budget law or, or to the organic law of state finances, everything is clear. And these are women who are in those positions and they're able to speak out. Thank you. So, yes. Another way is uh, creating networks of women in PFM. So here we expect to, there is at least a group, there is a team that is in there and is, that organizes or creates different networks. In this way, we are trying to brainstorm challenges uh, for, for such leaders or ch challenges that are still happening uh, within the system, the public finance system. There are elements of capacity development. When your women are in such levels, they are able to identify what specific capacity whereby women could be lagging behind and all that. Again, you find that when such women are in such levels, Thank they as role model, role model to other mm -hmm. women. So you find that it's possible. As you okay. have brought in well, Miss Kaba, that you find that uh, there's places where you find that you're so few, but as you bring this, as such women and such levels, others able to come out and they find that it's possible. Thank you okay. so much. I might have said a lot, but I wanted to bring out a whole picture on the background on what is currently is happening in Rwanda, linking it to the, uh, the question. Thank you thank, so much. Thank you so much, Mihima. And uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, because I also, as you know, all the time we need to, we need also to try to keep it, uh, your, your um, to keep it on time. But thank you very much for highlighting, I think, the, the, the important context of Rwanda, which I think is, is a model for, for many, uh, at least on the continent. Uh, and, and I think it was very interesting to hear from you also that the link uh, between um, you know the, the promotion of um, many women in, in Parliament, in also in the departments of Rwanda, and how this um, seemed to be uh, impacting positively gender um, gender gender equality. I would like also to encourage panelists to respond to points by other speakers, um, you know, as, uh, as as you wish. Let's now uh, do another round of questions. And I would like to turn to Bina again. Bina, how can civil society organization best advocate within CSOs working on public finance and for public finance institutions more broadly to advance gender equality? Yeah, thanks for the question. I think it's important as civil society uh, members, we are often uh, asking the government accountability, but it's also important that we ourselves try to reflect on what we are doing about it and, uh, you know, how do we advance the gender equity uh, in, in, in the organizations or civil society organizations that we work in. I think we really need to walk the talk. Uh, one is, I think it's really important uh, to see uh, and build leadership. So how do we build that leadership? If we do know that there is a gap uh, of women uh, leaders in the space, I think we need to ensure that we have special capacitation programs. I think 20, 25 years ago, uh, we wouldn't have seen any members from the Dalit community in this space uh, or from the indigenous community within India in this space. But now we're seeing more and more voices and that is because you know, somebody, some organization took it on themselves to capacitate, to bring them into these uh, spaces, to be part of these discourses and discussions. So I think consciously, as civil society, we need to make those changes and push for that. Uh, identifying uh, role models, I think uh, one of the panelists already mentioned this, that who are the champions who are there, you know, the current champions who we can call upon them for, you know, bringing in um, how they have been able to, you know, reach the level that they are. Uh, looking at good models, I think there are several good models globally, mm -hmm. but I would like, because this um, this panel is mod moderated also, uh, also be by the International Budget Partnership. The International Budget Partnership has, the India office has almost 80% women leading, uh, leading it in India, which is also really, really great to see uh, that women are leading it at the forefront in India. So there are several good models. So how as civil society, we can engage 
with these good models to ensure that we replicate these models in in uh, in in our own organizations but it also in other organizations and my last point would be that a lot of what we are doing and we are demanding the government is on data on disaggregated data how many women are in uh, you know in in this field what are the women doing where are the women you know who are the women that we can bring in you know uh, who are the women that we can capacitate so i think there we have a very large role to play to ensure that we have uh, you know we we can help with that disaggregated data and push one for the government to bring in the, that kind of a data but also as civil society we are able to provide uh, data uh, and support in that in in providing that kind of data so that we know where those gaps are and we can fill in those gaps i think that is very critical to ensuring that we have more women within civil society organizations and spaces uh, who are uh, you know part of these discussions in public finance thank you so much bina i think you your, your point about the data and actually um, underlines the need for us to know what we don't know because that that's very important so thank you for bringing that up because it it will it feeds into also better um, uh, evidence based policy making and implementation so i think that was very important now let me turn to zineb um zineb from your experience what specific actions do ministries of finance need to take to address the main barriers and promote opportunities for women to push to pursue and secure leadership positions Euh, merci beaucoup, Madame Malado. Alors, euh, comme euh, je, je l'ai déjà signalé, donc euh, ces, ces preuves, comme vous l'avez dit, des stratégies qui soient basées sur des preuves. Oui, Zineb, on ne vous entend pas. Je ne sais pas ce qui se passe. Comment Il y a un problème On vous entend, le, le son est très faible. Maintenant, ça va Est-ce que vous, vous m'entendez maintenant okay. D'accord. Vous très pouvez... bien, merci. D'accord. Donc, euh, je vous, euh, comme je vous l'ai dit, les stratégies sont basées sur des preuves et des preuves actuelles, ce qui a été fait par le ministère de l'Économie et des Finances. Et maintenant, il est en train de travailler sur un plan de, de un plan d'action court et moyen terme en se basant sur l'enquête qui a été effectuée donc l'une des, des des actions à mettre en place ou bien les leviers à mettre en place en premier c'est bien évidemment la question dont nous avons parlé la question des des, des, des infrastructures de proximité pour pour que les femmes puissent je dirais s'investir dans leur travail tout en, en allégeant ces impératifs je dirais qui, qui émanent de la, de la prise en charge des enfants Il y a la question aussi qui est très importante de l'instauration de l'égalité des sexes dans les appels à candidature. Donc ça, c'est très important. Et ce, à travers, je dirais, une, une des actions phares, c'est qu'il y a la, le renforcement de, de la présence des femmes dans les jurys. Et un autre point qui est aussi très important, c'est la question de tout ce qui est renforcement de capacité par rapport à, à ces programmes de développement, de coaching, de développement personnel, surtout de développement de leadership. Et parmi aussi les questions sur lesquelles les, 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 le plan d'action va se, se, se pencher, non seulement la formation, mais il y a aussi la question que les femmes, ils ont demandé une chose qui est très importante et à laquelle j'estime je, je, qu'il est important de... Que je dois la partager. C'est que les, âmes, les femmes, ils demandent au ministère de l'économie et de finances à ce que leur capacité de leadership ne soit plus sujet de discussion, parce qu'ils ont prouvé comme quoi ce sont des femmes qui travaillent et qu'ils ont une, une contribution opérationnelle technique qui est pertinente et comme quoi les femmes maintenant sont aptes à gérer et à gérer de manière qui soit 
et qui soit stratégique et ce n'est plus question de, 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 de prouver et encore de c'est comme si on a toujours besoin de légitimiser la, la, les compétences des femmes alors que les femmes elles ont été là elles sont toujours là elles sont contributrices du travail qui se fait à l'échelle euh, au niveau du ministère de l'économie et de finance ça c'était une doléance que toutes les que toutes les femmes du ministère elles ont je dirais elles ont ils ont mis la lumière sur ça. C'est que nous avons le droit d'être dans les postes de responsabilité parce que nous travaillons au ministère, nous sommes à compétence égale et nous avons un engagement vis-à-vis -vis de ce ministère pour aller de l'avant. Parce que les femmes, comme il a été déjà signalé, les femmes, elles ont prouvé comme quoi elles sont contributrices d'une manière significative à l'efficacité et l'efficience de l'action publique qui est maintenant une préoccupation à l'échelle internationale. Et je reviens pour prouver aussi, pour, je dirais, réitérer les propos de Mme Rehema du Rwanda et, et évoquer la question de l'habitualisation sensible des genres que pratiquent Rwanda et le Maroc aussi, et dire et insister sur le fait que l'habitualisation sensible des genres est un outil efficace pour pouvoir appuyer la prise de décision ou bien l'accès la, des femmes à la prise de décision. Comment Par exemple, pour le cas du Maroc, le, le cas du Maroc, il applique une budgétisation euh, qui est axée sur la performance. Et la budgétisation sensible aux gens, c'est une budgétisation axée sur la performance qui est sensible aux gens. Donc, chaque ministère, il est appelé à définir des objectifs en termes de, de taux des femmes, dont déjà de taux de féminisation des ministères et aussi au taux de féminisation des postes de responsabilité. Donc, ces objectifs, ils sont affiliés à des programmes budgétaires, des programmes du budget qui sont liés soit à la gestion des ressources humaines, soit à la gestion des compétences, qui bien ici, évidemment, sont intégrés dans les programmes budgétaires d'un ministère donné. Donc, chaque ministère est donc amené à bien ficeler ces programmes en matière non seulement d'objectifs à atteindre, mais d'actions à mettre en œuvre pour pouvoir atteindre ces objectifs. Et bien sûr, ces, 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 ces mesures ou bien actions, elles devraient être financées. C'est grâce, bien évidemment, à tout ce qui est utilisation sensible aux gens. Je suis juste pour dire comme quoi dans ce schéma dressé, c'est le principe fondamental de l'habitualisation sensible aux gens qui bien évidemment s'intéresse aussi à la question de l'égalité dans la gestion des ressources humaines et des compétences. C'est juste pour dire que c'est un cadre, cadre opérationnel idoine pour pouvoir encore appuyer la prise de décision qui soit davantage féminine parce que les femmes, elles ont toutes les compétences pour y être et en même temps, ils vont aussi contribuer à ce qu'il y ait davantage de retombées positives sur les citoyens et les, et les citoyennes et les citoyens. Ça d'une part, d'autre part, en relation aussi avec la BSG, un outil aussi, un outil qui permettrait de, de, de faire le suivi, l'évaluation par, par rapport à ces questions et aussi permettre de renforcer la question de reddition des comptes. C'est la question des rapports budget genre, comme on fait au Maroc. C'est un rapport qui accompagne la loi de finances la présentation de la loi de finances annuellement et à l'intérieur du rapport, bien, toutes les, il, est, il est question de faire le suivi de toutes les actions mises en place par les, par les ministères par rapport à la question de la réduction des inégalités de genre. Donc, au niveau du rapport budget genre, c'est aussi une plateforme pour assurer le suivi et l'évaluation de ces questions. Qui est le ministère qui a fait des avancées pourquoi il ne les a, qui le ministère ne l'a pas fait d'avancer Pourquoi il a fait des avancées Pourquoi il n'a pas fait des avancées C'est question de reddition des comptes aussi par rapport à la prise de décision, par rapport à l'accès des femmes à la prise de décision. C'est juste pour dire qu'il existe la BSG. Non, non seulement on doit être, je dirais, on ne doit pas être tributaire à la volonté politique ou d'une personne au sein d'un ministère pour qu'il soit le, le leader ou bien qu'il fédère la question de la prise de compte. Des, 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 des femmes dans les postes de responsabilité. C'est pour dire comme quoi l'accès des femmes aux postes de responsabilité, c'est un droit, c'est légitime, il doit être systématique. Et pour qu'il soit systématique, il faut un cadre opérationnel qui la rendre, pour la rendre systémique, systématique avec un système de, de suivi et évaluation. Et voilà, et merci. Thank you, Zineb. Thank you, Zineb. I know we can, we can go on and on and on and sharing our experience and all the challenges and how we overcome, uh, how we overcame them. Um, what, I what I take from your, um, I would say from your intervention is that 
women have the right to be um, in leadership position and maybe that should become uh, a mantra for uh, women working on uh, public finance management from now on. Um, I just want to highlight the fact that we, um, it seems that this discussion is getting a lot of attention from people all around the world. Um, and uh, for those who are tweeting, I just would like to underline, uh, I mean, to ask them if they could use the hashtag CSW65. Thank you. Uh, let me now turn to Rehima. Rehima, can you... Uh, Please, can you share your recommendations on how to strengthen partnership between ministries of finance and audit institutions and civil society organizations to collectively advance on this agenda of having more women in leadership position in the public, um, in public finance management? Thank you. Thank you, again. Thank you once again, uh, Ms. Kaba. And I would say that this is a very good question. Uh, I would say that this is a collective effort. It's a collective effort. It's not a one man's agenda. And the reason this collaboration is very much important. I would say that, as I said initially, when we look at audit, this is like the last phase in the public finance cycle, whereby it looks at M and E, whereby we're able to register our performance and evidence. And then this way, still you see, I would say again in Rwanda, this one is very critical, and that's the system that is already established, uh, whereby we have, of course, the Ministry of Finance working hand in hand with the audit institutions, and as well as the civil society. By the way, for us, even here in the Ministry of Finance, we have a contract with the, uh, the civil society, the umbrella civil society, whereby they have to participate in the entire public finance cycle, uh, mostly emphasizing from the planning cycle to budget preparations, institution, and to M and E, whereby they have even districts the level they're in there focused and uh, were able even to appreciate that uh, we do always what we call uh of course the budget uh, a book that elaborates uh guidance uh to the public about the budget and everything or like that whereby it's even the cso that finances it we work hand in hand with them they do the financing and we work together to distribute it. So first of all, I would recommend uh, in case of course to some other places may not be the case, it's better to have clear policy, a clear policy in place because that's always the basis. It's the basis without clear policies, it will be hard for the CSOs to come in. But then where those policies are not, I would say that it's good, the collaboration of the audit institution, the Ministry of Finance, and CSO, they can come up with one. They can come up with one uh, because, of course, when you come up with the policies from the public uh, side, they call all the stakeholders to give their inputs. But then you find that the CSOs are, are good in this and they would consider them critical, it would be good to come up with such policies. And then from in there, for that collaboration also to be sustainable, it's good to be clear on which forums, which forums do you always meet, be able to present on the uh, achievements, to be able to make uh, some kind of uh, 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 improvements and all that. And then again, I would also register that uh, these CSOs should be considered as real partners, uh, full-time partners, whereby when it's like in Rwanda, as I said in the entire cycle, these are people even when we are in the parliament presenting a budget, they are there. And the parliament has to ask them questions. What is their review? They always make an analysis of the budget, of course, looking into the public needs and all that. And then at the end, they're able to give to the parliament. When we are all there, Minister of Finance is there, you give that uh, review and their take on that. So those policies are clear, create forums whereby it's clear 
that they are in the parliament, they are part of it when it's time to present the budget. And as well as like you find after that, they, they follow straight to the execution, the auditing part of it. So I would say that the CSO should feel that they are part of this. They are part of the nation and they are part of the policy and they are also hold accountable by the way because here the parliament would even ask the CSOs, what is your contribution? Look at the priorities that are expected in there. What's your contribution? Uh, and in this way, when I look into, of course, gen uh, uh, gender, gender equality and uh, all that is expected, I, know, I said initially that we implement gender responsive budgeting. And that's the clear way to go whereby we are all there. The Minister of Finance is in there in the audits. Uh, the audit institutions are coming in. The COCOs are coming in at the end. We are able to come up with something, are able to present the achievements and then make some kind of uh, proposals for improvement. So they are much involved, all of them, collaboration in the monitoring and execution of uh, policies, as well as the budget, as well as uh, the, the results expected. And then the accountability, accountability strengthening. In that collaboration, you find that there, are, there, are, there is an element of accountability strengthening. But then I was able, I would be able to say that in order all this to succeed or to yield results, we need a clear capacity building, clear capacity building system. And then when I look at the capacity building, I'm, look at, uh, I'm looking at uh, capacity in even resources, the right skills, the right fi funding and all that. Uh, basically, Ms. Kaba, that's what I would say in that kind of, of collaboration. And I would say that I do recognize and appreciate it very critical in this agenda. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Rahima, for really bringing in the, the need for, um, I think, uh, governments and, and um, institutions to work hand in hand with uh, civil society organizations. Um, you also provide me with a nice transition when you, you also reinforced um, the, the need to, to hold uh, policy makers and decision makers to account. Um, and now let me turn to Marta, um, because I think Marta, we are just probably, well, maybe I'm, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we are just at the beginning to really understand how we can really tap into uh, the role of uh, supreme audit institutions in terms of uh, pushing forward gender, uh, gender parity. And so let me ask you this question. How can supreme audit institutions contribute to gender equal leadership? What role can stakeholders play in ensuring audit impact of such, sorry, can, sorry, let me <laughs> rephrase. What role can stakeholders uh, play in ensuring that audit impact of such audits by a supreme audit institutions. Thank you. Gracias, Malado, por la pregunta. Intosai ha promovido que los miembros, sus miembros, eh, contribuyan al cumplimiento de la Agenda 2030 por parte de los países. Y por supuesto, esto incluye el objetivo 5 de igualdad de género. Por esto, es importante, entre otros temas, que nuestras entidades de fiscalización superior reconozcan el impacto económico y social positivo que conlleva la igualdad de género dentro del contexto actual. Es así que se, se, es recomendable que se incorporen en nuestros planes de auditoría, eh, auditorías que contribuyan con el desarrollo de la igualdad de género. Además, las entidades fiscalizadoras deben incidir para que las acciones gubernamentales mantengan una efectiva coordinación con las partes interesadas, es decir, con el sector privado, con la academia, con las organizaciones no gubernamentales, etcétera, tomando en cuenta que el cumplimiento de la Agenda 2030 no es exclusiva del gobierno, sino también de las partes interesadas. A su vez, las entidades fiscalizadoras pueden contribuir con la equidad de género y los liderazgos, liderando con el ejemplo al resto del sector público mediante el desarrollo de acciones concretas 
a nivel interno. Es decir, las entidades fiscalizadoras, además de enfocarse en el tema específico de la equidad, también deben auditar temas relacionados con la educación, la salud, el combate a la pobreza, a la corrupción, la alfabetización digital. Es decir, enfocarse en factores de movilidad social, los cuales a su vez brindan oportunidades de desarrollo a los niños y a las niñas, a los jóvenes y a las jóvenes que van a consolidar este, la equidad de género. Para poner algunos ejemplos de lo que hemos hecho en las entidades fiscalizadoras superiores, decirles que realizamos una primera auditoría de género en el 2015. Esto en el marco de la Organización Latinoamericana y del Caribe de Entidades de Fiscalización Superior o la CEF. Se trató de una auditoría internacional coordinada sobre el cumplimiento de las políticas nacionales para la equidad de género. Lo curioso en esa oportunidad fue que solamente tres países quisieron participar, Costa Rica y Puerto Rico, porque tenían liderazgos femeninos, y Chile, porque la Secretaría Ejecutiva de la OLACEF estaba representada por una mujer. Los otros países eh, no participaron, pues tenían que hacer consultas internas o este tema no era una prioridad. El tema avanzó y este pequeño eh, paso de 2015 posibilitó que en 2018 se realizara una segunda auditoría con la participación esta vez de 15 países de América Latina, el Caribe y España. Esto fue de beneficio porque se auditó el proceso de, eh, de preparación para el, el cumplimiento de la Agenda 2030. Hoy puedo decirles que es un tema que se ha venido consolidando en la región. Incluso eh, hace unas semanas se dio a conocer el resultado de una encuesta liderada por la Contraloría de Chile, cuyo propósito es generar un insumo, es generar datos como aquí se ha mencionado, para formular una política de género a nivel regional para las entidades de fiscalización superior. Decirles que en esta época de COVID también, que ha impactado fuertemente a las mujeres, generar transparencia en, los fondos, en el uso de los fondos de ayuda ha sido fundamental. En nuestro caso concreto, lo hemos hecho mediante una página web y además mediante auditorías ágiles que han señalado posibles filtraciones de una transferencia monetaria que tenía, entre otros criterios de selección, beneficiar a mujeres jefas de hogar. En resumen, debe pasarse de la reacción hacia el diseño de acciones proactivas en el ámbito interno y externo tales como la definición de políticas internas de género, auditorías para verificar el avance en el cumplimiento de la Agenda 2030 y relaciones efectivas con las partes interesadas para la coordinación, la articulación y la generación de insumos relevantes al propósito de lograr sociedades donde la equidad de género avance positivamente y aumenten los liderazgos de las mujeres, quienes definitivamente aportamos soluciones inclusivas y mejores resultados. Muchas gracias. Technical issue. Thank you so much, Marta, uh, for your intervention and for really highlighting the role that Supreme Audit institutions can, can play indeed in, in uh, promoting uh, uh, women in leadership positions and also simply to promote uh, gender equality uh, worldwide. Um, we have now a selection of questions from our audience. So uh, let me start now um, with a question for Bina. Bina, how did you become visible and claim your place in the decision-making table? That's an interesting one. <laughs> yeah, I think I also responded on the chat. <clears throat> so I think that uh, the, the um, 
you know, when when they actually look through you and when they reject you, um, the the thing is that we should not lose uh, lose hope. So what I did was personally, I just kept on going. I didn't care whether they listened to me or didn't listen to me, but I had to make my point and and I made my point. And I think eventually, slowly, they came, this girl is here to stay, you know, she's not going to go anywhere. So I think slowly, as time went by, um, the same people who actually ignored me, uh, then started calling me for advice, you know, asking me what can be done, what what should we do collectively. Take. So somewhere, I think uh, you have to be a little bit assertive, you know, that's the uh, rule of the game, you just keep going, um, uh, despite, um, you know, people probably hating you for it but then I think at one point you do a uh, break even at some point where they look at you and they say okay she's here to say so we might as well just take her point and now we're you know I'm friends with many of these people probably uh, now uh, because you know they can't really ignore me any longer thank you thank you Bina um I actually I was also asked maybe to give also my own, to share my own uh, piece of experience in that respect, because I've been evolving um, for more than 20 years in a, in a largely male-dominated environment. In a, in a, I started my career in the Ministry of Finance myself, uh, which 20 years down the, line, down the line I would lead. So I don't know if it was destiny or anything else, um, but, I, but I, I concur with you. I think we need to be assertive um, and, and I recall a conversation recently, or, you know, maybe three or four years ago, when I was looking for uh, board roles, you know, because women um, places also in the boardroom. Uh, this is another place we, which is difficult to, to access. And I remember that the, the man I was talking to said, oh, but don't be aggressive. I said, I'm not aggressive. <laughs> I'm just staying, stay, staying, I'm just saying my point, standing my ground and, and that's it. So I fully concur with you. One needs to be assertive. One needs to be persistent, and one needs to be consistent, and one needs to be confident. And that confidence, again, is built by the opportunities you can get from your own work experience, but also by, by uh, learning, professional learning, capacity building, Rehima uh, uh, reinforced that point earlier. So thank you. Let me now turn to um, Zineb. Uh, Zineb, the question is the following. In your experience, what role can women finance ministers play in driving gender equitable outcomes? Thank you. Je pas bien compris la question. Est-ce que vous pouvez la répéter, s'il vous plaît? En français, si ça vous dérange pas, je sais très bien que vous menez très bien le français. Je vais traduire. Selon votre expérience, quel rôle? Quel rôle peuvent jouer des femmes ministres de, des Finances pour promouvoir mm -hmm. euh, de, de meilleurs résultats euh, qui visent à la, à la parité euh, genre D'accord. Donc, euh, je crois que ma réponse euh, va être en ligne avec la vôtre, avec votre expérience, Madame Ma Malado. Une, une femme ministre des Finances ne peut que contribuer à, à promouvoir cette mixité parce que tout simplement, c'est ce dont nous avons besoin pour atteindre de très bons résultats en, en termes d'action, d'efficacité et d'efficience, c'est promouvoir cette mixité. Et la mixité, ce n'est pas que des femmes et des hommes dans, le milieu, dans le, 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 la strate opérationnelle, mais la mixité dans la prise de décision, la mixité quand il y aurait des décisions qui devraient être prises au niveau stratégique pour que les soucis des femmes et aussi des hommes soient pris en considération tout simplement. Donc, ce qui fait que s'il y a une femme qui soit, je dirais, ministre, elle aura ce regard féminin. Le regard féminin, ce n'est pas le regard cliché ou stéréotypé dans notre, dans le, à auquel nous faisons face chaque jour, à chaque moment. Non, le regard féminin, dans le sens qu'il a davantage, je dirais, une question de diversité de regard, qu'il va penser davantage à toutes les populations concernées, à toutes les composantes, à toutes les parties prenantes, pour non seulement que le bénéfice soit partagé entre toutes les parties prenantes, mais que la décision soit prise aussi par les parties prenantes. Là, une femme ministre doit être sensible s'il y a des femmes ou non dans les, les postes de prise de décision. C'est tout à fait logique et normal. Et encore, les femmes, comme il a été déjà mentionné, 
quand il y a une femme qui prend une décision, par exemple, par rapport à la question de, je dirais, de la gestion de, de, de la crise Covid, les femmes qui sont des postes de responsabilité ou bien qui gèrent des États ou bien qui gèrent tout simplement, je dirais, toutes les réponses à la, à, la, à la pandémie, nous avons trouvé comme quoi leur stratégie, sinon leur, leur programme sont, sont efficaces. Parce que tout simplement, et, et déjà, ils, ils ont cette, cette facilité d'être entourés de, de bonnes personnes et de faire confiance davantage, de déléguer, surtout de faire confiance dans toutes les potentialités qui puissent exister. Et les femmes, elles ont des potentialités, comme je l'ai dit, Maintenant, nous a, il ne faut plus justifier la potentialité des femmes. Il faut aller vers leur mobilisation et pour pouvoir les mobiliser davantage, et que, il faut qu'ils soient dans les postes de prise de décision. Et une femme ministre des Finances, bien sûr, ne pourra être ministre que, que, que si elle est intelligente. Une femme intelligente ne peut, pourra pas se passer d'un vivier de potentialité que sont les femmes. Voilà. Merci, Zineb. Thank you, Zineb. Um, but I think, you know, we, we also know that sometimes it, it's not because you have a woman leading that she will also be necessarily for a number of reasons, right? She, she won't be necessarily looking at promoting gender parity um, because it's also very tough up there, you know, as we say, there's, there's a less oxygen when you the higher you go and the less oxygen oxygen you find up there. Um, but okay, that, that may be another, and we can have that discussion maybe on the side. Um, let me turn to uh, Rehima. Can you describe your suggestions on how public finance management institutions can ensure better work-life balance so that women can achieve leadership positions? Thank you, Buba, Baba, Kaba, for this. Sorry. And it's like public. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Yes, of course. Um, so the question is the following Can you describe your suggestions on how PFM institutions, public finance management institutions, can ensure better work life balance so that women can achieve? leadership positions? Well, I would say that first of all, it, uh, it, uh, it, it comes from the conviction, you know? And uh, let alone the conviction, it's again in line with what I said before. What are the national policies in place? Do they promote such, you know? Do they promote gender equality? Meaning that if those policies are in place, that means everything would be smooth. Everything would be clear. Such elements of segregations would not be there, basically. It would be minimized. And we, we noted that it starts from the, the grassroots, from the education system itself, because why I would say that uh, depends on their conviction, then the national policies. And as I gave an example, of course, Rwanda, one of the post objectives, gender objectives is education to all. That means that if women have access to that education, they have access to skills, that means then they have access to the different leadership roles that are really needed in there. So uh, to me, I, I, I would say that if the policies are clear, the conviction is in there that women are capable and the national agenda is clear, no segregation at all, then that means there wouldn't be such kind of limitations for women to possess uh, such leadership roles. Basically, that's what I would say. And uh, again, emphasizing much, you find many people always find that if women are, are on leadership roles, considering how busy they are with the family, uh, family engagements, uh, sometimes they're on maternity leave, 
sometimes they are breastfeeding, that's it. So that's why some, you know, employers try to fear much and they say, because I remember, I want to say, I remember one day when I was joining this role. So I was even, the minister was able to ask me how many children, how old, just to see that uh, if you're working in such a busy place, in such a leadership role, you'll be able to manage the engagement and all that kind of thing. But then if the national gender policies are clear on that, that limitations will be minimized. Thank you. Thank you, Rehima. That's exactly what we, we are looking for um, in your answer is also to share on your own experience. And, and I think you've all emphasized the, the need uh, to make room for, bal for to balance actually professional uh, as well as personal life. And especially uh, when we are women, this is uh, sometimes not easy, but I think that, um, well, we can now work remotely. So <laughs> I think that these questions may, may not be asked uh, in the future, we, we, we hope so. Um, let me now turn to um, Marta. Um, so the question is the following for you. What can Supreme Audit institutions change in their internal systems to make leadership more accessible? Bueno, eh, evidentemente debe existir una política de género en cada institución de manera tal que se permita avanzar hacia esa equidad de género y generar ese balance entre la vida familiar y la vida personal que en este foro se ha mencionado y que es muy importante para alcanzar esa equidad de género. En esta institución eh, tenemos actualmente un 65, un, perdón, un 57% de mujeres y un 35% eh, de los puestos gerenciales ocupados por mujeres. Y nosotros hemos vivido situaciones en las que por ejemplo, para acceder a los cargos gerenciales, las chicas se lo piensan mucho porque tienen también una serie de responsabilidades en su hogar y entonces eh, en principio tenían un poco de miedo. Pero hemos venido avanzando y facilitando ese balance. La Contraloría viene eh, con un programa de teletrabajo y de horarios flexibles desde hace muchos años antes de la pandemia y muchas mujeres han accedido a, a esas facilidades. Hombres también lo hacen, ¿verdad? Entonces, ha sido un tema de avance gradual. En este país, cada vez más mujeres acceden a, a cargos de liderazgo, este, no solo en materia de finanzas. Este país tuvo hasta hace muy poco la primera mujer ministra de Hacienda. Eh, contralora una primera mujer contralora en 2005, Luego es, eso abrió camino porque luego he sido yo Contralora en 2012 y, y, y creo que ha sido un avance interesante. Sin embargo, hace falta mucho por hacer. En nuestra última auditoría pudimos detectar que nueve de 14 ministerios no tenían una política interna de género y en eso hemos estado trabajando para que el país logre avanzar en este tema. Y sí pueden hacer mucho las entidades fiscalizadoras superiores para aportarle a sus países a lograr o avanzar en la equidad de género. Um, gra gracias, uh, Marta. I think I, I, what, what I like, in, in, again, you reemphasize the need to have policies, clear policies, internal policies. Uh, that will really make room to, to strike the right balance between professional life and, and personal life for women. Uh, you also mentioned men, and uh, of course, we all know that um, we need them to collaborate. This is a collective effort. This is a, a coordinated effort with them. Uh, as, as much as they are part of the, the, the problem sometimes, they also, of course, are part of the solution. So we cannot do that alone. We need um, our men. Uh, with us. Let me now turn to, this is a question to all of you, uh, Madam. What are your 
top three recommendations on tangible actions to advance gender equality in public finance management. Um, so maybe let me start with you, Marta. Would you like to, uh, to kick in? Claro, yo reitero eh, algunas de las recomendaciones que antes eh, mencioné. Uno es políticas claras, planes de auditoría para las EFS que, que promuevan este, la equidad de género y por supuesto los liderazgos. Seguir participando en los programas que promuevan los organismos de integración para promover los liderazgos jóvenes. Eso me parece muy importante, ¿verdad? No podemos eh, quedarnos atrás, tenemos que ir hacia adelante. Creo que es muy importante el, la educación, promover la educación y el aprendizaje este, en los niños y niñas, porque eso va a redundar en el futuro de las mujeres líderes. La educación es importante, la salud es importante, la alfabetización digital es importante y eso es para liderazgos en todos los ámbitos de nuestras sociedades y por eso el aporte que podamos hacer desde ahí es fundamental, el combate a la pobreza, porque todo eso son factores de movilidad social que van a permitir a la mujer visibilizarse. Las mujeres tenemos que visibilizarnos con asertividad, tenemos que distinguirnos por nuestros méritos, como lo hemos logrado. Sin embargo, hay que seguir avanzando, ¿verdad? La mujer debe tener mayor confianza en sí misma, ¿verdad? Para que se vayan abriendo esos espacios. Y también, como se dijo aquí, es necesaria la resiliencia para enfrentar la adversidad. Esto en todos los ámbitos de la vida. Pero para los liderazgos, ese es un tema muy importante. Gracias. Thank you, Marta. Um, let me now turn to, to Bina. Um, what would be your three top recommendations um, to, in terms of tangible actions uh, to, sorry, let me just get back to the, voila, uh, to promote women's leadership in public finance management? Uh, thanks, Ms. Kaba. Um, I think uh, I endorse a lot of the recommendations that Ms. Acosta has already said. Uh, that's from the state point of view, but from the civil society and from other organizations working on the ground, I think it's really important to break these structural barriers that actually uh, stop women from, um, you know, uh, reaching leadership positions. And what do we do about that? Of course, have policy, inclusive policy, but also policy that promotes diversity and bringing in women from all different uh, you know, sections of society. So specifically looking at how we can bring the last woman or trans woman to the front. So that's very important. I think that's uh, really critical to ensuring gender equity, not just looking at you know, one uh, women who have got the privilege to be able to be in leadership positions. Capacitation, you know, ensuring that the women that we think that can, can take up these positions, we need to have uh, capacitation programs so that we can uh, capacitate her to be in these positions. And my third one, which I've already said earlier, is the disaggregated data. How is it that we continue to push for disaggregated data in all sectors so we ensure that we, we do know what is the current status so that we can you know, uh, ensure we have mechanisms for bringing in more women uh, in these leadership positions. Thanks. Thank you, Bina. Um, let me turn to Rehima, the same questions, your top three recommendations um, in terms of tangible actions uh, to promote uh, women in leadership position in public finance management. Thank you so much for this uh, once again. Uh, still, I, based on what I've already said, I emphasized much the need for clear policies in place. And then when you have the clear policies in place, uh, we have discussed much the collaboration, collaboration of the different stakeholders. 
Uh, in this way, you brought out, of course, the Ministry of Finance, which coordinates the public finance management system in the nations. We brought out the CSOs, then we brought out the Supreme Audit Institutions. So that kind of collaboration. And then again, I would emphasize capacity building. As I said initially, it's also very critical in this. Thank you. Thank you, Rihima. Um, maintenant, uh, Zineb, uh, quelles seraient donc uh, vos recommandations clés pour des actions? Uh... D'accord. Euh... À promouvoir plus de femmes dans, à des postes. D'accord. Donc, euh, voilà, ce qui a été dit, j'y adhère parfaitement parce que tout simplement, il faut penser la chose selon trois niveaux. Il y a des prérequis. Les prérequis, c'est que déjà, il faut que les femmes soient davantage éduquées qu aient, et qu'elles aient à, à la, accès à une santé, à la, au, au service de santé, qu'elles aient accès à, aux infrastructures de transport, etc. Donc, on a déjà le prérequis qui est très important, qui est une stratégie nationale, ou bien toutes les stratégies nationales intègrent de manière systématique les questions d'égalité de genre. Ça, c'est un prérequis très important pour que toutes les femmes puissent accéder à leurs droits de manière équitable et sans, dist sans distinction aucune. Et après, il y a le, une autre façon de voir les choses, c'est la façon organisationnelle et managériale. Managériale, ça veut dire que donc, toutes les pratiques de management, soit au ministère des Finances, soit dans les autres ministères, prennent en considération la question de l'obligation la, de, la, de la présence des femmes dans les sphères de prise de décision parce qu'on ne peut pas continuer alors qu'un vivier, comme je l'ai dit, et une potentielle, euh, des, des potentiels sont oubliés. Donc ça, c'est par rapport au levier qui est managérial, y compris dans, aussi au ministère de l'économie et de finances, il faut que le ministère fonctionne avec toutes les poten ses potentialités et encore plus avec des femmes dans les postes de prise de décision parce qu'ils ont le droit en tant que femmes, en tant, déjà en tant que citoyennes, en tant que femmes battantes et combattantes et en tant que compétences parce qu'ils ont des choses à dire, ils ont leur mot à dire, ils ont leurs compétences à faire, donc il faut bénéficier. Il y a aussi un autre côté qui est très important, ça c'est le, 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 un autre niveau qui est très important, peut-être que je devais commencer par ce niveau, par rapport à la question de mentalité, parce que tout simplement, nous, nous parlons, nous, nous analysons avec des données, avec euh, gérer des stratégies, nous voulons des politiques, des stratégies déclinées, actions, plans d'action, court, moyen terme, mais si nous n'avons pas des mentalités qui évoluent, nous serons toujours là où nous en sommes. Sinon, nous allons même reculer. Ça veut dire quoi Ça veut dire que nous, de, nous devons travailler encore davantage sur la mentalité, dans le sens que la femme, elle a encore toute sa place dans, la, dans, tout, dans toute la, sa place dans la société et encore plus sa place dans la prise de décision et encore plus dans la prise de décision stratégique. Donc, à mon avis, il faut travailler sur sur les trois niveaux et bien évidemment quand on travaille sur les trois niveaux il y a une plateforme je dirais un point commun il faut penser aussi la question des infrastructures de telle manière que il faut vraiment penser à ce que la, la responsabilité de la prise en charge des enfants et des, aussi des personnes soit âgées soit des parents soit des personnes malades ne soit plus ne se ne soit ne relève plus uniquement que des femmes ça aussi parce que c'est un point qui est très important qui revient et encore revient soit, cela aussi doit être pris en considération mais il faut qu'on travaille sur les trois niveaux et voilà ma Ma, mes, mes petites recommandations par rapport à cette question. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Zineb. Okay, I think we are uh, heading now to the to the end of this uh, very interesting and lively discussion. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it and I was extremely honored and privileged to have all these um, powerhouse women uh, with me today. Uh, and so I hope the, the pleasure was also yours. Um, so we, before we close out this session, um, I think I will give you two minutes to, for your concluding remarks. Two minutes, please. So maybe let me start with Zineb. Uh, 
n'ai pas compris par rapport aux remarques de clôture. Mmh. Oui. D'accord. Alors, euh, moi, par rapport à tout ce que je peux dire, c'est que je vais encore réitérer, réitérer déjà mes remerciements à toutes les organisatrices et organisateurs qui ont été derrière le, cet événement qui est d'une grande importance parce que, sincèrement, nous ne pouvons pas aller de l'avant si nous n'avons pas une décision qui soit inclusive. Ça veut dire qu'une une décision qui émane des femmes et des hommes de, de nos pays respectifs. Et donc, pour moi, comme je l'ai déjà dit, euh, c'est très important que nous travaillions sur les mentalités, que nous travaillions sur l'accès des femmes à leurs droits sans distinction aucune et nous travaillons aussi sur la question d'accès des femmes à tout ce qui est études, formation, capacitation, qualification et autres compétences pour qu'elles puissent être ce qu'elles veulent être, pour qu'elles puissent travailler sur son avenir, pour qu'elles puissent être une part intégrante euh, avec un, une part, une part Prenons une partie prenante de nos sociétés parce que les femmes, et nous sommes des femmes, nous travaillons énormément, nous voulons le meilleur de chacune et de chacun de nous, nous voulons le meilleur de nos sociétés, de nos nations. Et les temps maintenant, nous avons prouvé nos compétences, nous avons prouvé que nous sommes des personnes qui sont au service de nos pays, au service de la gestion des finances publiques de nos pays, donc et de manière, comme je l'ai déjà dit, efficace et efficiente. Et les temps maintenant, qu'on fasse, qu que, que nous arrivons à notre palier, c'est le palier qu'on soit une partie prenante des décisions, parce que les femmes, elles, elles ont cette, la légitimité de ne pas participer à la décision, elles ont les compétences pour, et maintenant, il faut juste leur laisser l'espace pour l'exercer et bien l'exercer. Et merci. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zineb, and, and my, my apologies for the other speakers. I am told that we, we need to conclude. I think a lot was said, um, very interesting uh, takeaways. So uh, I would like to first thank all the panelists for their excellent remarks and the participants for their great questions. Um, I, I think my the, the five takeaways from on my side from all the discussions that we've had today are the following. Number one, um, know what you don't know. Uh, use survey data to create policies and structures to address barriers women face. Number two, women ensure women are not just given token representations, but are in actual decision-making positions. Uh, Otherwise, in other words, you know, let's be visible and, and, and let's, let's keep on doing what we're doing. Number three, human resources policies should be modified to support flexible working hours and family emergency leave. I think that this was really something that uh, um, um, came across uh, your um, interventions um, uh, for you all. Number four, provide mentorship support and concrete opportunities for professional growth. Uh, and I think that this is really important, again, to grow the confidence, to grow also the resilience that uh, Marta mentioned and, and some of you also uh, mentioned. And number five, make visible across the institutions, the contributions of women. Uh, that is also very important because uh, we know that women not, not necessarily take, I would say, they don't own their success, they don't own their achievements, and we need to own them because they are ours. So please own your success. Um, I would like to again thank all the panelists for sharing their insights and expertise with us. And I would also like to thank the sponsoring organizations, UN Women, International Budget Partnership, and the Intosai Development Initiative. Thank you all so much. And I hope that this uh, will take us uh, forward. And thank you again for all my distinguished panelists. It was uh, really a pleasure to meet you here. Thank you so much. I think we can now end this uh, very interesting discussion. Thank you, keep safe and bye-bye. And